be picked. Okay, I got it. That's the recording is going on. Um, so we, have, we, we selected um, for previous campaigns Leipzig, Limassol, and Punda Reynas. And you see that we have around one, uh, two, to, two to almost three uh, orders of magnitude uh, variability um, in the CCN, but also in the uh, INP properties. So a very good approach to investigate. Yeah, and Lacrosse was taken to Leipzig as a home base since 2011. Uh, we were in Limassol, Cyprus uh, from 2016 to 2018, and in Punta Arenas from 2018 to 2021. Uh, let's have a look. Um, where, while you will have a lot, get a lot of information about Limassol today, I would also like to show you some results of the other end of the world, which was uh, Punta Arenas, where the conditions are very different to what you would expect uh, on Cyprus. So Punta Arenas, where the Dacapo Peso field experiment took place, is located on the very southern tip of South America, 53 degrees south, and um, it is 8,000 kilometers away from the next uh, downwind um, um, just, um, island or um, land surface, which is New Zealand, and it's even 700 kilometers south of New Zealand. So we can expect very clean conditions. And here you see a photograph of the site setup uh, in Punta Arenas, uh, similar to our really nice co cooperation on Cyprus. We also here had a cooperation with the University of Magallanes, namely Boris Barria and Felix Zamorano, who uh, in, uh, supported us um, in uh, deploying the instruments over there. And uh, nearby the field site with the lacrosse containers and also a partner instrument from the University of Leipzig, a 94 gigahertz radar. We had the radiation measurements going on with sun photometer and the diverse short wave and long wave radiation sensors. And even 10 kilometers away on a mountain of 600 meter height on the Cerro Mirador, we had um, samplings of uh, ice nucleating particles. Uh, the seven day uh, periods. We had a CCN counter running to collect the cloud condensation nuclei uh, information, and we collected aerosol size distributions with aerosol in situ measurements. Here you see a map of um, the world, which shows the collocated ground based aerosol and cloud profiling observations. It means um, the months. Of, uh, of measurements of combined LIDAR, radar, micro radio, microwave radiometer observations of the globe with a deadline of uh, December 2021. And you can see that the cross observations already filled a nice uh, or a, a rather huge measurement gap in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean or close to the uh, Middle East region with 18 months of measurements. And the Punta Arenas deployment in, uh, for the Capo Peso provided the only um, 36 months measurements to the a huge region of the southern uh, hemisphere mid latitudes. Yeah. And um, let's now get to the overall setting of the lacrosse facility. And in general, we can say, or we must say that lacrosse is fully committed to Actris. And Actris is the aerosol clouds and trace gases research infrastructure um, of the European Union. It's a research infrastructure which provides um, measurements to the scientific community and to other stakeholders about the short-lived components of the atmosphere. And if we look in, uh, to the overall actress um, structure, we have two main subcenters of actress to which Lacrosse is uh, affiliated. And those are the actress center for cloud remote sensing, CCRES, and the actress center for aerosol remote sensing, CARS. And with these two remote sensing uh, centers, we have a lot of uh, expertise exchange. So we provide a lot of information of our technical developments, but we also get a lot of information back about calibration procedures, quality assurance, data management, and so on. But Lacrosse, uh, besides Actress, is also uh, dedicated to new developments, which are uh, not directly in, uh, um, led by Actress. 
And uh, here are some examples. These are huge European uh, um, projects like the Bachus, where also Zyker was a part of the project, where also uh, cyber experiments uh, participated. We have our LIDAR network, Polynet, which is uh, also an ongoing in-house uh, development um, project. And we are also um, dedicated to um, German Science Foundation projects like the uh, radar polarimetric uh, modeling um, combination project PROM, where we also have several projects going on. Of course, there's also a change going on between the science projects and ACTRIS. And uh, Lacrosse is going to provide its data sets free for, uh, for public use to the CloudNet and EarlyNet um, communities, which are also part of ACTRIS. And uh, we also provide services to international stakeholders by means of the European Union project Atmo Access. So you can, you can just type into Google Atmo Access and um, this gives you the um, possibility to book lacrosse services. So you can uh, either uh, get uh, receive training uh, for lacrosse instrumentation, but uh, it goes up to um, ordering or booking of deployments of lacrosse on dedicated uh, at dedicated locations. So just have a look, and uh, these access modalities are only possible for international transnational access. So lacrosse, as it's a German uh, super site, can only be booked by other countries, not by German countries. Okay, special about lacrosse is also its data processing. At the bottom, you see the different instruments I have already introduced. And these instruments provide a different uh, level zero variables, so basic plane measurements like Doppler velocity, atmospheric motion, backscatter information of the aerosol from the LiDAR, um, liquid water pass and brightest temperatures from the radiometers. Distrometer provides um, rain rates and rain size distributions and the cloud radars provide also velocity information and information about the presence of clouds. This data needs to be processed in a solid way with as lo low effort as possible because we have so many data. So we need to have the, the, the LIDAR processing in the poly net uh, uh, network and the, um, the other instruments are regularly processed within CloudNet. From these processing uh, chains, we get level two products, which is or level one, so higher level products, which are, for example, cloud condensation nuclei concentrations, IMP concentrations, cloud and aerosol uh, target classification products, liquid water content of clouds, ice water content of clouds, and so on. And these can, of course, later on be used for other processing and uh, for data analysis schemes. And for this, we have the so-called lacrosse research data analyzer, which was developed by Johannes Bühl and Martin Radens. And um, they, those can be uh, connected to, for example, cloud and aerosol identification schemes. And based on these uh, processing schemes, which are all running automatized on our servers, we can, for example, do um, case studies and statistical evaluations, for example, uh, to study the ice formation processes in mixed phase clouds. Okay, let's have an overview on the data availability of LaCrosse. And this is shown um, here. Um, where you see um, the timeline of the lacrosse deployment since 2014. It started with a accept campaign, which was uh, taking place uh, in Cabau in the Netherlands. Um, we went on to some break in Leipzig to prepare for the Psycare campaign, went back to Leipzig, and then we went for the three years experiment to uh, Punta Arenas in Chile. And you see that uh, the major instruments which we require for our data analysis uh, chain run more or less continuously, like uh, specifically the Mira 35 uh, Cloud Radar. The, um, by means of the LiDAR PolyXT, you see that we operated different LiDAR systems over the years. So there are in total three different instruments used, but uh, using these three, we have an almost continuous timeline. The HUD Pro microfotometer also worked almost continuously, and the Doppler LiDAR Streamline uh, was deployed uh, or started to work uh, back in 2015 when we obtained the instrument, and since then it's running almost automatically. Also, our backup LiDAR system, the Zillometer, is more or less running all over. 
Important input is also um, model information to get thermodynamic profiles because weight distance are very expensive. We are using the global data assimilation system and the integrated forecast system from ECM WF vessel forecast, which is a, supplied to us by, via Actris. Okay, let's get to some examples of uh, studies we perform based on our lacrosse observations. Here's um, an, an insight into the combination of remote sensing uh, of remote sensing measurements of aerosol and in situ measurements of aerosol. The study was done by Jean Dagong. Uh, indeed, the, the study is meanwhile available for, um, for uh, at ACPD. Um, a Copernicus journal. And in the top left, you see um, a, a series of um, the, the uh, relationship between temperature and the number of isolating particles. And each of the curves is one seven day sample. You see red and gray, red ones were um, heated. So these, um, uh, so in this case, all biological particles, proteins and so on were um, destroyed, and the, the, the gray ones are the plain unheated samples. So you see a difference that there's some kind of organic fraction in the ice nucleating particles. And if the organics are killed or destroyed, the ice nucleating efficiency reduces. If we look in slider measurements, we can also see that uh, we have the aerosol properties observed at Punta Arenas. You see, especially in the boundary layer up to 1.5 kilometer height, a lot of aerosol. Yeah, and from the LIDAR, thanks to hard work of uh, Rodanti uh, Mamori and Albert Ansmann, who did this work 2016 based on Cypress measurements, we have uh, techniques available to relate LIDAR derived number concentration of aerosol particles larger than 500 nanometers and the in situ derived number concentration of particles larger than 500 nanometers. But for this, we need to know what aerosol type it is. And you see here two different aerosol types assumed, continental aerosol and marine sea salt aerosol. And you see that the good correlation is only available for the Punta Arenas region if we use the continental aerosol. And this gives us the reasoning that the boundary layer aerosol in Punta Arenas is, is indeed con uh, dominated by continental aerosol and not by marine, even so Punta Arenas is very close to the Pacific Ocean and to the Atlantic Ocean. On the other hand side, Chan Gong investigated how his IMP measurements correlated to different parametrizations which are available in the literature. And the best fit was obtained for a parametrization provided by uh, Tobo et al. 2013, which is for mainly for um, uh, forest areas. And uh, this indicates that the continental aerosol, which was observed upon arenas, is um, similar to forest aerosol. So in conclusion, we can, if we do measurements on Punta Arenas, we have to assume that the aerosol is of continental origin and contains ice nucleating particle properties similar to, bio, uh, to forests, which are also available on Northern Hemisphere. But uh, Lacrosse also helps, the continuous observations of Lacrosse also um, help us to observe the atmosphere continuously and to look for special events. And the special event in Punta Arenas wa was, was the strong Australian wildfires. You see here an example of the wildfire plume as it was um, producing pyrocumulonimbus uh, plumes on 31st December 2019. And um, this um, plume injection uh, caused an increase, uh, more than a doubling of the aerosol optical deaths over Punta Arenas in the period between January and April 2020, compares the dashed blue line to the solid blue line. And of course, uh, still, Punta Arenas optical deaths is much lower than Leipzig and Limassol. But um, with the Lacrosse uh, LiDAR Poly XT, we were able to probe the aerosol which was injected by the smoke uh, from the Australian fires over uh, almost two years from January 2020 to November 2021. So even though the aerosol slowly dissipated, as you can see in the color index of the plume height distribution here, it was still measurable in November 2021. Very impressive amount and already published in several publications. 
And here you see a, a, an example of the LIDAR measurements of the main plume end of January 2020, which where, was, uh, where the smoke was observed between 10 kilometer height and 26 kilometer height. Okay. And uh, concerning cloud uh, investigations, we are working hard to use Doppler spectra observed by cloud radars. Now it's getting a bit more complicated as you are mostly uh, used to aerosol observations with LIDAR, but radars are capable to observe on every data point the Doppler spectrum of all of the particle motion of all particles observed by the cloud radar. So for each data point, we see the, the velocity distribution of all particles. And of course, we see different peaks, and each peak is um, is representative of a certain ice or liquid droplet population. And if we develop um, sophisticated separation techniques, we can indeed uh, split a measurement which looks uh, basically like the left hand one into two different um, scenarios. You see now so the measurement split by the Doppler spectra properties automatically by a technique of Martin Radens, and we could uh, use this to separate the ice cloud into two different populations. On the top hand, you see that there was um, a, a dendrite layer formed at minus 15 degrees Celsius, and at, at another uh, location at minus 5 degrees Celsius, a columnar ice crystal layer was formed and falling to the ground, producing much more signal than the dendritic layer. And this was also indicated by, by the linear depolarization ratio, which was very high for the, for the strongly non-spherical columnar particles and very low for the plate-like um, dendritic particles. We are also observing um, deep convective clouds, which is very helpful for Cyprus, for example. We have techniques together, uh, um, developed together with the University of Leipzig to detect liquid water within clouds based on machine learning algorithms. This um, The retrieval here is very catchy, is the name, uh, Voodoo. You can also Google for it as it is currently published in AMTD. And we have also scanning techniques uh, available by using the scanning cloud radar, we can observe the different particle types in the clouds from dendritic particles, columnar shaped particles, rhyming of particles, and finally, Kraupel formation. And this agrees very well to the locations of, um, of uh, liquid water. Yeah, and finally, where we also use the uh, Cypress data set for, we, um, in, we analyze um, long-term statistics of stratiform mixed-phase cloud observations. This was done in a big data analyst approach of Martin Radens. And what you see here is, a, is the final result of the study. And I will take the final minute of my uh, presentation to briefly present to you what is shown here. So again, it's a it's a anal analysis of the long-term observations at Leipzig, Limassol, and Punta Arenas, and you see on the left-hand side, uh, on in the center of the of on, of this panel, the um, the um, the relationship of the frequency of ice-containing clouds as a function of the temperature at cloud top of the observed stratiform clouds. And you can see differences for the different locations. Um, in, uh, in Leipzig and Limassol, the fraction of ice-containing clouds increases until about minus 10 degrees Celsius, and then almost all clouds contain ice. But at Punta Arenas, the, um, the, the fraction of ice-containing clouds is much lower up to temperatures or down to temperatures of minus 15 degrees Celsius. And only then it reaches approximately the ice fraction of Leipzig and Limassol. And we could now um, assume that this might be caused by the lack of ice nucleating particles um, at Punta Arenas. And indeed, as Martin Radens also investigated the lighter observations by means of their um, um, ice nucleating particle properties, he could show that indeed in Punta Arenas, the um, fraction or the, yeah, the amount of ice nucleating particles um, is much lower compared to Leipzig and uh, Limassol. And um, so if we assume pure marine aerosol at Punta Arenas, we reach at uh, three to four orders of magnitude less 
ice nuclear particles than in, at Leipzig and Limassol. If we assume a small fraction of continental aerosol in the free troposphere over Punta Arenas, it might be, uh, it, it's rather close to the curves of Leipzig and Punta Arenas. So it's very impressive. We, uh, Martin Radens in his study using the data sets from Leipzig, Limassol and Punta Arenas was able to show that the reduced ice nucleate in particle concentrations have actually an impact on the fraction of ice containing clouds at these sites. Okay, and um, with this final um, slide here, I want to conclude. This is an overview on all the projects currently related to uh, Lacrosse observations. And uh, you can see there's also some uh, parts where the names of the Cypress colleagues are mentioned. And we're also looking forward to continue our cooperation in the frame of uh, ECOE, Excelsior, and Chirocco. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, just a disclaimer for the recording. It's going to be used just for reporting uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can get some questions for Patrick now, if there are any questions, because uh, he needs to go for other uh, obligations. Are there any questions to Patrick? Too much information. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, then, uh, thank you, Patrick. And uh, we can continue with the presentation by Dr. Johannes Bull on the analysis of uh, global precipitation patterns in the framework of Sirocco. Um, Dr. Johannes Bull, also from uh, Tropos team, works on synergetic data products from combined remote sensing instruments. His main focus is currently ice nucleation and precipitation formation in clouds. Uh, you may share your screen. Oh, thank you, Eleni. Um, let's see. Yeah, let's go like this. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. So I will uh, present some material that is actually um, original from the Sirocco project. So I was part of the project and uh, since 2017. And um, so I was uh, mainly focusing on the evaluation of uh, radar data from uh, space and also from ground. And today I will talk about the results of the space-based analysis of precipitation. Um, that was uh, with, a, with a focus on basically how you can, how representative observation on, observations on Cyprus are for the observation of global precipitation. So um, my outline for this talk is as follows. I will give an introduction and I will show you how I, uh, what methodology I use to an analyze the global precipitation patterns observed by the CloudSat satellite. And um, I will um, analyze the sensitivity of Actress CloudNet as a whole to these patterns. And um, of course, um, since Limassol will soon be also part of um, this network. I will um, talk a little bit about um, what gap actually is filled by the Limassol station. And yeah, I'll give a summary and outlook. So the main science questions behind the whole story is, of course, the overarching problem that precipitation drives the global ecosystem. Um, but it's under constant change. So um, we have to understand precipitation globally, and we have to understand how these patterns change in order to be prepared for, for example, for climate change. Um, so the, the basic question um, that I am interested in is which physical processes control precipitation globally? This is um, basically um, basically unknown <laughs> this question there are of course there is a lot of insight into cloud there is also a lot of global insight but especially from uh, satellites 
it's very difficult to understand what processes actually happen. So you can see what happened, but you do not know why. Um, yeah, of course. And the last question, which precipitation patterns can be observed on Cyprus? Um, as I um, said before. So, uh, but uh, let's go into media's race uh, directly. And um, let's look at a landscape, could be a sea surface or a land surface. And um, with a certain temperature scale on the left. And um, in this landscape, you can um, visualize some clouds, some precipitating clouds. And depending on how high these clouds reach and how cold their top gets, um, you will have different kinds of precipitation formation. For example, if the cloud only gets around a zero degree Celsius, the cloud top, uh, then you will probably only have warm rain formation. If it gets to minus 20, immersion freezing kicks in, which already um, dominates uh, in, in most clouds. Um, you will have after the immersion freezing process started at cloud top and the cloud particles grow, you will have secondary ice formation to, for example, splintering, which is depicted here. And if you have the very high reaching clouds, um, then you also have homogeneous freezing and um, deposition freezing, uh, which makes uh, the, the following process is very complicated because then you have about 10 kilometers of cloud column uh, where a lot of stuff can happen. But the result is always the same. Precipitation is falling at the ground. And uh, this is what we can look at globally uh, with a satellite, for example. So let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, and that, that was the idea that um, for the, the idea for the methodology I actually um, had during Sirocco. And I thought we could just have a look into um, this analysis, uh, into this data set um, of CloudSat, just to see uh, what basic picture emerges from the data itself. So the um, scenario is again the same. We have an island basically. This is Cyprus. This is the Mediterranean <laughs> in this case. And um, a cloud is forming ice and precipitation. And we observe it um, at the ground with the cloud net station. We have a distrometer to record precipitation rate. And we can see the cloud tops with a radar. And from above, we, we have the cloud sat, um, satellite with its cloud profiling radar. And uh, the product that I will use is the 2C precip column product, which basically only tells you that there was a precipitation event detected at ground or over sea. And it will give you the corresponding cloud top height. So basically, this is one event composed of a detection of precipitation at ground and a cloud top height. And with the uh, help of a um, weather model reanalysis data, uh, you can even derive the precipitation initiation temperature at this point at cloud top, uh, which is called PIT minus 15, because it's, there's a certain rule uh, involved that uh, you will follow the um, profile from the top. And when it reaches minus 15 dBZ, then, well, it's considered the, the top. So to have a little well, this, this noise control, basically, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter. So our approach is to use the cloud SAT measurements and basically assume that cloud net, cloud net, uh, look at this net here, this is cloud net, this is the cloud based stuff, could provide the same observation for a given location. So that this measurement basically would be the same as the measurement from the satellite. And then we can make um, some conclusions about how representative is CloudNet, how, how representative is our own CloudNet observation at Lima Seoul, for example. But that, um, for, to that we will come later. First, the question is, how do we make sense of this whole data set? 
As I said, we have this observation of precipitation events and cloud top um, um, temperature, basically precipitation initiation temperature. So we put all precipitation initiation temperatures that have been detected uh, with a corresponding precipitation event into a histogram. So we will get for each point on the global surface, we will get a histogram. This is latitude longitude and basically the histogram of this precipitation initiation temperature of cloud side. So, and, and you will have some histogram at one point. And at another point, you will have another histogram. In order to make sense of these, we now have to uh, introduce a um, criterion um, which tells us when and uh, how these um, histograms are similar. So a, basically we need a number to compare them. And for that we need, uh, we use the Pearson correlation coefficient called R. And this correlation coefficient goes from uh, minus one to one. And it will tell you what the correlation between the uh, histograms is. And so basically how similar they are. And our similarity criterion is that if the Pearson correlation coefficient is greater than 0 0.85, we consider two profiles as similar. This is a very important definition, basically the only assumption that goes into the following analysis. Um, yeah, so how, what does that tell us? If you look, for example, at the site of Barbados, this is a CloudNet site, you will see this histogram of PIT minus 15. So this is this basically collects all precipitation events that have been collected by uh, CloudSat over Barbados over the lifetime of the satellite, basically last 15 years. And um, you see a strong peak at 280 Kelvin, which is basically warm. So you will basically have warm rain over Barbados. And uh, now, of course, we come to our favorite uh, island, actually favorite island, <laughs> Cyprus. And if you um, if do the same evaluation for Limassol, you see a little bit different pictures. So uh, a, little, a little bit different picture. So you see barely any warm rain and uh, most of the precipitation that falls in the Eastern Mediterranean is actually um, produced by ice, so at, at least at colder temperatures, uh, at super cool temperatures. So you have a completely different set of um, precipitation forming processes. And this picture on the right shows you now basically um, where on um, the, the globe you can find similar precipitation forming situations. And this gives you an interesting contrast here because um, the Barbados site is actually a tropical site and Limassol is, is, a, um, is the Mediterranean site. The, it's both marine sites, but you can see that, the, that Barbados is only representative for really for the tropical regions of the oceans and the um, continents do not count. So there's no correlation found, no significant correlation found with anything um, on the continents. In Limassol, it's different, although it is a marine site, it's considered a marine site, it has more the characteristic of, um, of a continent. You can see that you have large correlations with Central Europe, so that means that the profile that you can see here that is characteristic for the precipitation formation over Cyprus is more similar, for example, um, to the profile at Paris or at Berlin than at Barbados. So it's completely, completely different, actually. So that is um, the basic methodology. And now basically we want to find out, we go from, from with this technique, we want to find out what basically is the, um, what are the, the precipitation patterns that prevail globally and that we can do by simply comparing all of the recorded histograms with each other uh, in a principal component analysis. 
So uh, <laughs> the idea is to take these, I think it's 20,000 histograms, and for each histogram, calculate the correlation with all others. And then we group, of course, the similar ones with an R, um, which is, um, oh, this is wrong. This must be greater than 0 0.85. <laughs> so, and uh, the result are these histograms. And these histograms basically always represent one principal component of the data set. And I, you can see that these colors, they, comp um, they compare to a certain region on Earth where this principal component can be found uh, with highest probability. I will magnify it. So that's the first major result. You can now see um, for each point on Earth in which basically precipitation forming regime you are. So for example, over the continents, Germany is blue. That means category number one, which is here, this one, this is probably the most um, frequent precipitation histogram that you can find on Earth. You, you find it in the northern land masses, and you can also find it in the southern ocean. Um, for Limassol, it's a little bit different. In the eastern Mediterranean, you have another profile, but um, that would lead too far. The, the basic message um, is that you can identify different regimes of, regimes of precipitation formation. So, but let's now um, get away from the global view. Let's concentrate on the Eastern Mediterranean and run the analysis again for Europe. And in this analysis, you can see how a highly resolved, basically, application of the method can look like. Um, you see, again, a group of similar precipitation characteristics over Europe, also over the landmass of Great Britain, for example. But as soon as you approach the ocean, the North Sea, and the Mediterranean, your characteristic is different. And if you, you can again, um, you can again link this to uh, several uh, principal components. And here you can see, for example, the principal component that is uh, relevant for Cyprus is uh, the pink or the orange one. They, they are very similar, actually, if you look at it. Um, but they are, of course, um, distinctly different, for example, to this category that, that you can see, which shows more, um, which shows more um, warm rain, and they're still similar to the um, category, for example, of the continental land masses. So, um, of course, the question is now, again, how representative is um, um, a site, a CloudNet site, for example, Limassol? Can we quantify this? And yes, we can quantify it by just calculating for each um, location on Earth, how many of, of the ground-based uh, network sites show a similar precipitation characteristics. And from there, we can uh, basically uh, calculate a number. This is um, red means there's no uh, significant correlation found So the, those um, precipitation characteristics that are marked red are basically unobserved by ground-based remote sensing networks. If you have uh, this yellow color, then you at least have one similar side that shows the same uh, precipitation characteristic and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, in Central Europe, you have more than 10 sites showing the same characteristics, so you're a little bit uh, over-occupied. <laughs> Um, but if you now uh, do the same analysis uh, for, again for Europe, uh, you can see that the Eastern Mediterranean um, is actually unique. You can see that the characteristics here stands a little bit out. You do not have a lot of sites that can uh, observe this characteristic. You are basically at one, two or three, while you have, yeah, again, more than 10 sites for the whole um, um, European landmass and also the Western Mediterranean. So 
This site at uh, Limassol, oops. This site at Limassol is really important because you really have a completely different, measurably different set of precipitation characteristics in the Eastern Mediterranean. And Limassol is a quite unique um, site and, an important, and will be in future a very important site. Um, so let's sum up. You made a data-driven analysis of global precipitation patterns based on the CloudSat data set. A Limassol site has been found representative for precipitation characteristics in the Eastern Mediterranean. And it will be an important um, location for Actress Cloud Net Network. Um, as an outlook, uh, in this analysis, at the moment, only precipitation initiation temperature is included. We could include other variables, like, for example, aerosol, cloud cover, etc., uh, which could make the result a bit more meaningful uh, and a little bit uh, make the analysis uh, a little bit broader. Um, you, it could be combined with modeled actually, models. Actually, this aerosol cloud cover could, could be taken from models if there are no uh, direct observations available. And um, it would be interesting in future to compare the observation of CloudSat and eventually also EarthCare uh, to the actual observations will be, which will be made um, at Limassol. Yeah, thank you for your attention. That is my input. Um, yeah. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, very insightful presentation. Um, we can get uh, questions for the first uh, part of the workshop uh, before going for a short break. Um, so if there are any questions, please feel free to unmute or type in the chat. A lot of information, so I guess no questions. Um, so we're going to have the short break now. And as we are uh, five minutes uh, late, I think we can keep the 10 minutes and get back at uh, 25 past 11 uh, East European time. Thanks. <laughs>
So we can proceed with the uh, second uh, part of the workshop and with a presentation by uh, Dr. Ronnie Engelman on wildfire smoke, Arctic haze and aerosol effects on mixed phase and cirrus clouds over the North Pole region during mosaic. Dr. Ronnie Engelman is a lidarist and an atmospheric physicist who works on remote sensing measurements at sea and at land stations. He worked in the Arctic during Mosaic, and currently he helps to prepare the Oceanet Atmosphere Platform to make CloudNet measurements at Neumayer 3 station in Antarctica for a full year in 2023. You, you can proceed with your presentation, Ronnie. Hello, Eleni. Thank you. Hi. Um, I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. I hope it's okay. Is, is that the yes, correct one? Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, thanks for the invitation. Oh, welcome to my talk. And I thought I'd show you something uh, about our measurements during mosaic in the Arctic, close to the North Pole, uh, with LIDAR, radar, and uh, yeah, many other things. And I thought it is maybe a good example to see how you can use LIDAR, radar, and combine it, and in the same way, to make studies in, in, in Cyprus in the future, because the instruments will be quite similar. Um, so uh, the outline is more motivation. Then I will show you how aerosols can be transported to the Arctic. Um, and then I want to show you a LIDAR-based aerosol climatology from basically the North Pole. And then uh, how we can link aerosol properties to cloud properties in the last part uh, yeah, and some conclusions. So the first question, why would we go to a place like this? Uh, the North Pole, especially in winter, is 1,500 kilometers away from the nearest settlement. Minimum temperatures is, was minus 42 degrees Celsius. We, visit, we got visited by 60 polar bears close to the ship, and the cost of the expedition was about 200,000 uh, euros per day. So, and here you can see there is polar stern, uh, the vessel, the small research camp, and then there is the vast space of uh, nothing. And yeah, why we go to a place like this? Because it is actually a hotspot of climate change and really a hotspot because it's warming much faster um, than any other region on earth. And this is what we call Arctic amplification. And also the Arctic sea ice is declining natural habitats are changing and because of changing weather patterns we have more atlantic waters in the arctic and so the whole ecosystem and uh, is, is changing as well and i just found one plot uh, that uh, demonstrates the changes maybe very good uh, yesterday and this is a daily arctic sea ice thickness about basically my lifespan so when i was born you can see that the thickest ice um do i have a pointer uh, the thickest ice you can see usually in the Arctic in March when it's, it's the coldest. And there were ice thicknesses of two and a half meters, but especially in summer, the ice thickness of this area here is maybe even around one and a half meters. So all year round, you have thick ice in the Arctic. And around 2000, this, uh, in the year 2000, the things started to change. And even you can see now during uh, the coldest periods uh, in March, the ice thickness goes maybe down to one and a half, one to one and a half meter, and in summer, just a few 20 centimeters or sometimes even nothing. So big changes. Um, and, and in order to study this, uh, the mosaic expedition was planned, and the whole idea was to have several icebreakers, especially Polarst, and the German one is frozen close to the North Pole and being drifted for a whole year. And uh, yeah, make very many different observations. And in fact, it turned out that uh, we moved with Polar Stern on 1st October 2019 here, stopped the engines and let the ship drift. And then over the month, you can see how it, the, the Polar Stern drifted very close to the North Pole, just 200 kilometers away. And in March, it came out in uh, Spitsbergen again. And what you also have to say is this is a whole region where uh, the Calypso lighter cannot see anything because it's not flying there. So we're scientifically blind when it comes to aerosols there. And 
what you would expect now from this region is that you would have very clean conditions because there is no aerosol sources, the nearest land masses are far away. And uh, yeah, the surface is just ice. And so you wouldn't expect to find many aerosols. But what also happened in August and summer 2019, before we started, uh, were a lot of So there were optical depths, uh, there were aerosol optical depths on the order of one to two in these fires, so that we, we, as a monthly mean. So it means you couldn't really see the sun because of the fire smoke for a whole month. And this was a large uh, section of Siberia. Um, but now it turns out we live in an age of uh, massive wildfires. And these are not the only wildfires that we observed uh, on the earth. There were also fires in Australia and in Siberia again, 2021. So those fire uh, amounts are increasing. And now the question is, uh, can this aerosol be transported to the North Pole? Um, and uh, there's paper that shows several different pathways. And in generally, you could say on the Arctic, you have a very cold air mass, and this is usually defined or said to be the polar dome, which is quite impenetrable for, for aerosols to get into. Um, but there are different mechanisms uh, how the aerosols can get there. And I think we might have even found uh, another one, uh, which uh, we'll, probably Kevin will be talking about in the next talk. <laughs> Um, so our instruments were our ocean and atmosphere container with the Raman lighter on board of the ship. And then we had the arm side, uh, the atmospheric radiation measurements from the US and they brought the cloud radar. And with those two instruments together, we could combine, could do combined measurements. So um, in terms of Arctic aerosol, these are some examples from December, February, March. And uh, you can see a lot of aerosol layers up to 12 or 14 kilometers even. Uh, while we were thinking that there wouldn't be a lot of aerosol. And one distinct one is the wildfire smoke high up here from the Siberian fires I mentioned, and this is what, what Kevin will talk about next. And on the surface, you have a lot of Arctic haze, for example. Um, and if you look where this Arctic haze is coming from, you can do some back trajectories and you can see in this case for, 4th of February, uh, the aerosols most, mainly came from Europe. So these are continental European aerosols from winter time, even reaching up to the Arctic. And here you can see some uh, a typical LIDAR plots of backscatter and extinction. And we have a LIDAR ratio, which is very much uh, around 50 and means we have a lot of continental aerosol. If you would have marine aerosol, because you think you're in the Arctic Ocean, and then you would have lighter ratios much lower, but we didn't really observe them because the, the surface is ice covered. So the main origin of this aerosol was not the Arctic itself, but the long range transport. And then when you are there for a whole year in the Arctic, you can make a, a climatology and see for all the months, what are our conditions of aerosols. And then you can see um, during winter time, October, November, we have an extinction at the surface around 40. And here on the top, we see the wildfire smoke. And then during winter time, the aerosol gets more and more and more. And typically in spring, you call the surface aerosol Arctic haze. And uh, yeah, it goes up to 100 in, in, in average of an extinction coefficient. And then when you come to the summertime, um, which is where most expeditions before have been made to the Arctic and where, where the belief comes that the Arctic is very, very clean in June, July, you have a lot of cloud processing at the surface and it's always humid, low clouds and all those clouds, they clean the atmosphere like a washing machine. And um, yeah, then you have very, very low uh, aerosol conditions in summertime, but you have a lot of clouds. Um, and what we are now interested in, in terms of uh, climatology, we want to know how many uh, cloud condensation nuclei are there. And so with the, there's the method that you use Arctic photometer stations uh, from Albert Hansmann, and um, he derived the conversion factor typically for air, Arctic aerosol of, of four to five. So you can convert this extinction into a typical CCN number concentrations. And, and with this plot, we have a, a more or less a climatology for the whole year that, that could help modelers in, in the future. Um, 
but uh, liquid clouds and cloud condensation nuclei are not, are not the only thing. The Arctic is cold, so there's a lot of ice clouds. Um, and what you see here is uh, these red ones are all cirrus clouds. They form in an altitude of eight kilometers. And then they sediment down and the uh, particles grow or particles fall. And, and in this case of, for example, 6th or 7th December, you can see that th those ice crystals are evaporating here in a very dry air dome. So the particles uh, disappear again. But still, you see all this aerosol and smoke layers around where these ice crystals are forming. And here on the bottom, you see a plot for four days where, where you can see constant formation of ice clouds, of cirrus clouds in the smoke layer above. So this is still an ongoing investigation, but uh, we find very many uh, hints that the ice, uh, that the smoke is, is a, a, a relevant IMP for, for, ice, uh, yeah, for ice clouds in the Arctic. Uh, there's a project uh, to analyze more of those, yeah. And this is just to summarize you a bit uh, what we were doing. So with our instruments, OceanNet and uh, LiDAR and ARM radar, we can make Arctic aerosol profiles, we can determine particle types, and we can try to make parametrizations, like, like I said, you just see in the CCN profiles, for example, and also the ice nucleating particles. Profiles. So this is this is the one thing from the lidar side, and from the lidar radar uh, combination, we can uh, derive Arctic cloud parameters, and with the different assumptions and different methods, we can, in the end, come to cloud droplet number concentrations and ice crystal number concentrations. So now the question is, can we find a closure between cloud parameters and actual clouds? Um, and that this works, I want to show you on one case uh, of an Arctic mixed phase stratus cloud. So those clouds are very important in the Arctic. Uh, they are there for a long, long time, several six hours in this case. You can see how much effect they have on radiation and, and they're basically the radiative driver of the Arctic. And when we use our LiDAR, we can now use uh, the cloud condensation nuclei uh, number that we can derive next to the cloud, for example, when, when the cloud was not there in the aerosols, we see how many particles are able to form clouds. And then with our dual field of view LiDAR, what Christopher is telling later, probably, you can uh, determine the particle, uh, the cloud droplet number concentration in the cloud. So, and then you can see, can I link my aerosol number concentration to my cloud droplet number concentration? And uh, yeah, this is what we can also do with with the lighter, and then you can do the same thing also for ice crystal number concentrations and uh, IMP concentrations. And this is my last slide that uh, shows you when we have this uh, liquid cloud here in, in, in two and a half kilometers, and this liquid cloud is precipitating out and ice is falling out of there. Um, then we can see that we have a CCN number concentration of around 30 next to the cloud, 30 to 70. And our cloud droplets number that we see in the liquid layer here is on the order of 20 to 90. So they are the same order of magnitude. So it means our parametrizations for CCN in the Arctic, they fit very nicely to what we see from the cloud droplet number concentration. And the same we can do for the, for the ice crystal number concentrations and for the IMP concentrations. And when we assume uh, a few parameters, we can estimate an ice. IMP concentration of, of 0.2 to 0.4 per liter on average in this case. And when uh, Johannes uh, is using the method that he, he showed here, you can derive the ice crystal number concentration in the cloud. And again, the question is, do my IMP and my ice crystal number concentration fit together? And in this case, you can see that they are also in the order of 0 0.1 to 1 per liter. So those uh, parameters also fit very nice together. And, and, and I just want to mention that this is also something that, that can be done in Cyprus later on with the remote sensing instrument. So a small conclusions, uh, Mosaic, there was a full year of aerosol cloud observations close to the North Pole that has never been done so far. Um, the Arctic aerosol conditions are very much dependent on height and season. Um, and 
we can make CCN and IMP parametrizations at high levels for cloud actually form and where they are important. I showed you the link of the uh, uh, the linking of uh, the CCN and the cloud droplet numbers and the IMP and the ice crystal numbers um, for this Arctic uh, stratus closure from ground based to remote sensing. And this work just has been done. More evaluation is ongoing, and, and maybe you even see some more in the next talks. That's it from, from my side. Thanks. Thank you, Ronnie. Um, I think we can get questions at the end of the session. Continue. We can continue with the next presentation now from uh, Kevin Oneiser on the unexpected small layer in the high Arctic winter stratosphere during Mosaic 2019 to 2020. Um, Kevin Oneiser is a PhD student at Tropos in the remote sensing LiDAR group. Currently he's working with LiDAR measurements on um, of wildfire smoke in the lower stratosphere and its impact on the atmosphere. Thank you, Kevin. You can go on with your presentation. Yeah, thank you for your introduction. So yeah, welcome to my presentation about this uh, unexpected smoke layer in the high Arctic winter stratosphere during the mosaic campaign in 2019 to 2020. So um, starting with the outline, first of all, I want to present you this UTLS, so upper tropospheric, lower stratospheric smoke layer during the mosaic campaign. And with this, there was a new pathway of smoke into the stratosphere observed. And I want to talk about the influence of smoke particles on the ozone reduction. Finally, the summary. Yeah, so uh, this presentation is about the mosaic campaign that uh, Ronnie just introduced. So it's the multidisciplinary drifting observatory for the study of Arctic climate. And um, yeah, with Tropos, we were on board with the Oceanet container. And um, our role was to monitor the aerosol and cloud situation with the LIDAR up to 30 kilometers height very close uh, to the North Pole, yeah, as Ronnie already also showed. And that's why I already want to start with the measurements. Um, so here, what I want to show you here is a first measurement example um, from Mosaic. It's on the 25th of October, 2019. You can see the LiDAR measurements. Uh, it's the range corrected signal at 1064 nanometers from the surface to 17 kilometers height. And in this plot here in the lower heights, uh, you can see some aerosol layers and some clouds with some verga. Then higher up, the air gets a little bit cleaner. But here, somewhere from five or six kilometers to 15 kilometers, you can see a lot of aerosols. So the, the whole um, upper troposphere and lower stratosphere is filled with aerosol. And uh, yeah, this is very unexpected in the central Arctic because it was thought to be very clean and pristine. So uh, yeah, therefore it's, it's worth to have a deep look into the optical properties of this um, aerosol situation. Also because this, um, yeah, this aerosol layer was not just there on that one single day on the 25th of October, but it was there in the entire autumn, winter and spring period from 2019 to 2020. So um, yeah, what I want to show you for the, from the optical properties is the backscatter coefficient, particle linear depolarization ratio, extinction coefficient and the LIDAR ratio. And starting with the backscatter coefficient, you can see that this layer is again somewhere between five and 15 kilometers on that 25th of November. And the maximum of this layer is somewhere between nine or 10 kilometers. And what you can also see is that there is a strong wavelength dependence. So at the shorter wavelengths in this range here, we have a much larger signal compared to the, uh, to the longer wavelengths. So the backscatter coefficient is much larger here. And if we compare this to the extinction coefficient, then we see that this wavelength dependence is not as pronounced as for the backscatter coefficient. And this means that when we take the ratio of extinction to backscatter coefficient, which is the LIDAR ratio, then this is again wavelength dependent. So um, yeah, well, we've, we find what we find is that the LIDAR ratio at 532 nanometers is approximately 20 to 30 steradian higher than compared to the 355 nanometer uh, LIDAR ratio. And this is a typical fingerprint of smoke particles. So um, yeah, also this very high uh, absolute number of 70 steradian at 532 nanometers, it means that we're dealing with a very absorptive aerosol type. So here we're definitely dealing with um, smoke particles. And on the other hand, we can also look at the particle in a depolarization ratio. And there we see that the values are somewhere between yeah, one and 2%. 
And um, this is typical for spherical particles. So um, these, these smoke particles were a very long time in the stratosphere and were aging for quite a while. And therefore they are spherical uh, in shape. Yeah, and now that we know that we're dealing here with smoke particles, of course, the question arises, where does all the smoke come from? And uh, actually there was no large uh, pyrocumulonimbus convection in the um, summer of 2019 in the Northern hemisphere. So we have to look into extreme events. And um, yeah, Rania already showed you this um, satellite picture. And I, I want to show you here uh, the, the situation of the aerosol optical thickness in, in those different boxes. It's the region of Siberia, which I show you here. And um, so somewhere, somewhere here in uh, Central Eastern Russia. And what you can see is that the aerosol optical thickness, it was increased uh, in summer 2019. So from July to August with values of one or even two. And this is on a, on a very large scale. So we're really dealing with areas that are almost as large or even larger than Germany with extremely large average aerosol optical thicknesses for a full month. So the, the full atmosphere was um, filled with, this, um, with these smoke particles. And uh, in, in addition to this, the, the weather situation was very steady. So we had um, stagnant, steady conditions, which uh, led to this um, yeah, increase of smoke uh, that can enrich in, in the troposphere. And um, yeah, usually um, what, what is needed uh, in order to bring the smoke then also into the stratosphere is uh, the pyrocumulonimbus convection. So it is the cloud that is generated from the, um, the fire itself. So usually when a cold front approaches then the air gets a little bit more instable and then this fire generated cloud can start to form which brings the smoke within less than an hour into the uh, tropopause region. But this did not happen here and uh, therefore um, there is this new pathway of smoke into the stratosphere which I want to explain you now. But before I come to this, uh, I want to show you the well-known uh, situation with the pyrocumulonimbus cloud. Also there, of course, we need these extreme fires. Um, and if we have these extreme fires and a cloud, a pyrocumulonimbus cloud is starting to form, then the smoke can be lifted into the tropopause region um, within shortest time, within le less than an hour. And there, yeah, when the, the smoke is optically thick, then it can, uh, radiatively heat up, so it absorbs the short wave radiation of the sun and can therefore heat up and is warmer than its surrounding and therefore it can lift, self-lift in an altitude with approximately one kilometer per day. And um, these particles, these are fresh emitted into the uh, stratosphere, so they are quite non-spherical in shape and uh, have a depolarization ratio around 20% because they didn't have much time to interact with the gases in the troposphere, so they um, they are not yet uh, spherical in shape. Yeah, and the other process, this new process, uh, which the Siberian um, fire smoke must have taken is uh, this one, what I want to explain you now. First of all, uh, all the smoke, it um, accumulates somehow in the uh, lowest heights and it will not reach uh, heights of more than five kilometers just from the, um, when it is released. But then uh, also here, the, um, the, the uh, layers, they were so optically thick that they absorb the short wave radiation from the sun and uh, could radiatively heat up and also self lift um, these few kilometers into the tropopause uh, height level. And it takes approximately three to five or three to seven days um, of lifting until it reaches the, the tropopause and can accumulate there and can also reach uh, the lower stratosphere, of course. And during that time, um, the particles get more spherical in shape in the troposphere when they interact with the gases there. And therefore the depolarization ratio is around 2%. Yeah, so this is the process that happened in Siberia and we can also see this from uh, observations. Um, this is now Calypso observations over Siberia on the 26th of July, 2019. So when all the fires were occurring and you can see that the, the full uh, troposphere up to the tropopause and even in the lower stratosphere is filled uh, with, this, um, with this smoke, with the, uh, with the smoke layers. Yeah, so this is the process that uh, that drove this, and it's a new pathway of biomass burning smoke uh, to the stratosphere. And yeah, now I want to show you the long-term evolution of the measurements. So um, yeah, well, the fires they occurred somewhere in July and August, so at the beginning of this plot, 
and mosaic it just started uh, in in october so there are no measurements from uh, from the lidar on plage stand before but still uh, this aerosol layer it was there as i already told you for the for the full autumn winter and spring period and you can see that uh, the boundaries of this layer is somewhere between six or seven kilometers to 17 kilometers so it's approximately 10 kilometers deep this aerosol layer and you can also see that the largest part of this aerosol layer is um, above the tropopause, so here in black, and that the uh, extinction coefficient, it gets weaker with time, which also means that the aerosol optical thickness, it decreases somehow exponentially with time. And then um, in spring of 2020, so when the polar vortex collapsed, the last layers were occurring, and afterwards there were no uh, smoke layers observable anymore. And what you can also see is that this upper part of the smoke layer here is somehow overlapping with the lower part of the polar stratospheric clouds in the central Arctic. And this is a, um, what brings me to the next topic, the interaction of um, yeah, smoke and polar stratospheric clouds and ozone. So um, what was the situation um, in, in 2020 is uh, that there was this record-breaking ozone hole here. Um, you can see in this range of the plot, there is a lot of blue colors, which means that we have negative um, ozone particle pressure deviation. And uh, yeah, this ozone hole was in the spring of 2020, somewhere between 12 and 22 kilometers. And if we look into the boundaries of the uh, smoke layer, the smoke layer top height and the smoke layer bottom height, then we see that there is an overlap um, of this ozone hole uh, and the smoke particles. And um, in this case, I, I also want to bring the Antarctic case into, into play because there, uh, we have a full overlap because um, maybe you remember in the um, in Australia in, in the last days of 2019 and the first days of 2020, also there were record-breaking um, um, fire events and they brought enormous amounts of fire smoke into the stratosphere. Here it was even higher up and therefore in 2020 and in 2021 this ozone hole was fully overlapping in height with these um, with with the smoke boundary. So. Uh, the smoke was within the uh, the ozone hole layer and yeah therefore it's worth to have a deeper look into the height resolved way of this overlapping situation of the smoke ozone and um polar stratospheric cloud situation i want to start again with the arctic so on the left side you can see um the particle surface area concentration in uh, 2020 for um yeah for the smoke somehow and the climatology here in gray and so in, in 2020, you see that the surface area concentration was around one order of magnitude increased compared to the climatology, especially somewhere between seven and 17 kilometers. And this is also the height where we find this record breaking negative relative and absolute um, um, ozone deviations for so this ozone hole. Um, it's a little bit higher up. And also uh, what we have to say in the Arctic is of course, that the polar vortex was very strong in the winter of 2019 to 2020. So indeed we had a record breaking polar vortex and this means that also the temperatures, this gray dashed line here, were very low, approximately yeah, six to 10 Kelvin uh, below the climatological mean. And of course, this is a, an important driver to form all these polar stratospheric clouds, which will um, deplete the ozone then in the respective spring. So, but still the process that could drive this additional ozone loss is that the smoke particles, they are a surface to form more and smaller polar stratospheric cloud droplets that um, have a larger surface area concentration then where um, halogen like chlorine can start to form and this um, depletes the ozone then in the respective spring. So for the Arctic, it's, it's hard to say how large the influence of the uh, smoke particles was on the ozone hole. But much more convincing, this looks like for the Antarctic, because also there um, with the Australian fires, we had the situation that the surface area concentration was The temperature situation, but it can be um, it can be somehow explained with this um, aerosol situation. And what's furthermore striking is that in 2021 we had a similar situation again, uh, still enhanced 
particles and ozone negative ozone deviations in that height range. And um, yeah, so to summarize, there was around one to two millipascal of additional absolute ozone reduction, which means a relative ozone loss of the order of five to 25%. And with the final summary, so during mosaic, there were, was this Arctic troposphere and lower stratospheric air, which was found to be smoke polluted throughout the whole time. So the, um, the autumn, winter and spring period. And it was um, attributed to the Siberian wildfire smoke from the summer of 2019. And with this, a new pathway of smoke into the stratosphere was found through the self-lifting process. And um, furthermore, the smoke in the uh, stratosphere influenced uh, the record-breaking ozone reduction in the spring of 2020 via the polar stratospheric clouds, with around 10 to 20% in the polar stratospheric cloud region in the Antarctica, or 30 to 50 percent below the polar stratospheric cloud height range. Yeah, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. And we can proceed with the presentation by Dr. Christopher Jimenez on monitoring aerosol effects on liquid water clouds with dual field of view polarization LIDAR. Uh, Dr. Christopher Jimenez studied physics at the University of Concepcion in Chile and pursued a PhD in the remote sensing group of Tropos. Uh, his work has, has been devoted to the development of methods to retrieve aerosol and cloud properties from remote sensing instruments, introducing in the last years a new LiDAR technique to observe uh, clouds. Christopher, um, you can proceed your, with your presentation. Hi, sorry. I was just here Hi. moving around <laughs> my window. So I can just fix the camera. Okay, so I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you see my screen now? Yes. So uh, hello, welcome everyone to my talk. So thank you, Eleni, for the this nice introduction and for the invitation. So today I will talk about one of our developments to retrieve information about liquid water clouds by using LiDAR measurements, specifically measurement of polarization of two different field of view. That is why I wanted to put this in the picture here, I think I can. Can you see my my mouth? Yes. All right. So here we have a picture of the concept that we are exploring, which is the multiple scattering effect, which happens when you have a lidar system hitting a, a dense layer such as liquid clouds. So here we have a picture of how this looks like. So we exploit the future of this multiple scattering to get information basically about the size of the droplets. So this will be mainly the content of this talk. So firstly, I will give a very short introduction. Then I will talk about this new measurement concept, which is the dual field of polarization LiDAR. And I would like to give an, uh, an example of the application of this method. And then I will give some preliminary results by showing some of our long-term results that we have collected until now. And at the end, I will give also a short summary. So for the introduction, I will be very briefly here because my colleagues Patrick and Rodanti, they already gave a very good introduction about the importance of aerosol cloud interactions. So firstly, we have in the case of arm clouds. Now I would like to just enumerate some of the uh, mechanisms, how aerosols affected clouds. So firstly, we have, if we have clouds, form in a polluted environment with much more particles, which can act as CCL, where you have clouds with more droplets and smaller ones, which will have an effect, of course, in the relative properties of the cloud, but also in the precipitation properties as well. Additionally to this, we have, if we have smaller droplets, we will have less drizzle, which will affect the lifetime of the clouds and also affecting the relative properties. If we have this, we will have um, and in, 
increase in the vertical mixing, which will also extend the lifetime eventually. We will have faster evaporation, for example, in the case of warm clouds. And this could also induce more entrainments. So these are processes that in how aerosols affect us. Then if we consider convective and cold clouds, there are more mechanisms which make the picture much more complicated. So here we have freezing in the clouds, which will start higher if we have a polluted environment. Even higher if these INP particles that are uh, being activated here have solubing coatings. Additionally, we can have an updraft invigoration because of the freezing of this particles. And at the end, we have the very thin tension process in which ice grows at expenses of liquid droplets. So it's a quite complicated picture here. And the effect in the royalty budget, it is still unclear of what they all do as an individual, but also as a, as a total. So here we have, for I wanted to show you the, the last IPCC reports, which show us what is the effect that aerosol cloud interaction have in the relative budget. And we see here the, in, in two colors. This one we have in green, what's aerosol radiation interaction produced. And then we have in this pink one, dark pink, what aerosol cloud interaction do. And we see that in the last three reports, we have a reduction in the bar in the error bar. So we have more agreement between observation as modeling, but we still need uh, a, a, a full understanding about the processes that are involved. So to improve this, we really need, as our colleagues says before, we need observation of the number concentration of droplets in the dotted here as ND of CCN particles, of ice crystal number concentration, and also of ice nucleating particles. And this has to be done in the long term continuously at super sites. And that's what we were aiming to pursue with our measurement campaigns during the last years. And of course, all this mechanism not only affect the radiative properties, but also the precipitation properties of the cloud as well. So it's really important to measure these quantities for for uh, a better understanding of the processes involved here. So now I would like to show you the technique that we developed in the last year. So I will go again here. So this has been the goal at our institute. So during, I would say the last two decades, and we came up with the solution of measuring a two, a two field of views, which is the, the picture that our telescope for LiDAR can see. And we found out that measuring Raman signals, we can get a very good approximation to retrieve the information about the microphysical properties of the cloud, such as the extinction coefficient and effective radius. And this method uh, is very robust, but it can only apply during nighttime. So during my PhD, I uh, introduce a new method which consists of measuring a two field of views as well, but now measuring polarization. We found out that in polarization measurements, you, you have uh, information about the droplet size when you measure at these two field of views. So we have our laser here in the middle, we have one small field of view, which is a little bit larger than the divergence of our laser. And we have a second field of view, which is much wider. So the basic feature that we explore is that if you have smaller droplets, they will have a much spread as forward scattering. So it could be more open. As when you have large droplets in which this forward scattering is much narrow. So by measuring the polarization, we can really have information about how this forward scattering behave. So what we do, we have these measurements of two field of views. In our case, in our system, we have one milliradian and two milliradian of divergence of this field of views. We make an assumption about our cloud layer, in the case of liquid cloud clouds. And then we have a lookup table approach in which we can get these measurements and retrieve the basic parameters of the microphysics of the cloud, which are the extinction coefficient and the effective radius. And from these two, then we can derive the liquid water content, the noted W here, and the cloud droplet number concentration, ND. 
So now I would like to show you how we do this experimentally. So this is the setup of our poly system. So here we have the emission part, then we have our receiving telescope, and here we have different detector channels. So this is the usual setup for poly system. And to upgrade the system into a dual field view polarization LiDAR, we just needed to add one more channel, which measures just the cross polarized uh, signal. And this is similar to the telescope that we use for the near range of the LiDAR. So we have one far range coming from the big telescope which has his polarization channels here in green. And then we have these two telescopes which comprise the second field of view, the bigger one, although the telescopes are smaller. These two channels can be used then to get the depolarization at this second field of view. So at the end, we have a system measuring this property at two field of views, which is the depolarization. Now, how we use the depolarization to get this, the microphysical properties? So this is done by applying a multi-scattering model, which allow us to simulate different cloud scenarios. So here I show you an example of a cloud located at three kilometers height, in which we simulate with this model how will be the, the depolarization ratio at the one of the field of view, the, the inner field of view, and the outer field of view, which is the larger one. And we wanted to see here how they relate each other by different combination of the effective radius and the extinction coefficient. So here we have a combination of four uh, times four. So we have 16 curves here in total. So we can see here, if we consider the ratio between these two depolarization, we see that they depend, I will back, come back. There is a dependency here between this parameter and the effective radius, which is not here by these different symbols. So see here that if the particles are larger, they are closer to one. And if they are smaller, this is uh, closer to zero. So from here, we can establish a relationship to, to retrieve this parameter. And this is shown here in, the, in these two plots. So what we do, we consider this ratio of depolarization between the inner and outer field of view. And from this, we can get information about the droplet size. For example, if we have this value here, about 8.5, we will get an effective radius about 7.9. By using now this effective radius as a second step, we go now to these curves on the right, which show us how the extinction coefficients behave depending on the the polarization of the inner field. Of view. So here, for example, if we had already the effective radius, we can now select the right curve. And from this one, we can then retrieve the extinction coefficient. So these are the two basic products that we can retrieve by using these measurements. And from these two, then we can derive the liquid water content and the cloud dropping normal concentration. So there are assumptions that are inside this, this approach, and there are several calibrations that we have to perform before applying the method. But now we have made some experience, and we have a robust approach for doing this analysis. So this approach started in 2016. And the first system in which we applied this was the MARTA system deployed in Leipzig. And here we found good agreement by comparing these results with the, the other dual field of view Raman technique. And also we found agreement with uh, outputs from the ICON model, which simulated the situation in Germany. And after doing all these tests in our MARTA system, we went to the Poly XT, which is our standardized poly system measuring automatically a different region of the planet. So here, we added one channel, and now we have this poly system with 12 field of view in several systems. So we have the LACRO system, uh, which uh, Patrick showed before. We have the, the new poly XT measuring in Dushanbe in Tajikistan since 2019. We have the OceanNet LiDAR, 
we was measuring the last uh, in 2018, 2020 in the high Arctic during the mosaic campaign. And we also have a policy system measuring it at Limassol since 2020. And finally, we have another system measuring in Cape Verde. And all these systems are measuring continuously. So now I would like to go to a measurement example. So this is, for example, a measurement for the 26th of November, 2020 in Limassol. And this is very preliminary. So I just started to analyze this data last week. And this is one of the first results that we can get. So here's an example, for example, um, of a cloud layer forming at between two and three kilometers. And these white points that we, you can see here denote the cloud base that we estimated for uh, doing this retrieval. Then here we have the input parameters for the scheme, which are the depolarization ratio integrated from the cloud base up to 75 meters. And this is calculated for both kilometers. So here we have out in the blue one and in in the orange one. And from these two parameters, then we calculate the ratio. And this ratio is the one that we use to retrieve the effective radius. So here we have these lines, the orange and the blue lines, which denote the limits of the possible range where these values can be. So depending on the value here, we will have a given effective radius. So now in this example, we have so the same plot again, but now I'm showing the microphysical properties of the clouds. And these are the values 75 meters above the cloud base in all these time series. So firstly, we have the extinction coefficient where we have values mostly between 20 and 40 per kilometer. And then we have the effective radius, which stays just between five and 10, mostly. And now from these two basic parameters, we calculate more uh, a more interesting parameter, which, has, which are the liquid water content by using this equation. And then we can also get an estimation of the cloud travel number concentration, which is the parameter in which we're interested when we want to study the, the effect that aerosol clouds that aerosol have in the formation of these clouds. So, so this is just one example. So at the end, we can get with very high resolution this uh, microphysical information in these liquid layers. And from LIDAR, we can also measure very accurately the aerosol situation below these cloud layers. And this can be do all, do, done almost uh, automatically as well. So now, and before you go, so here we have also values for the cloud drop number concentration, so between 100 and 200 per cubic centimeter. And I think this is something that we can expect for the situation that we have in Limassol with a mixture of different aerosol conditions and usually with, a, with high values of concentrations. And this is now we will see how this compare with long-term measurements as we have already processed here. So here we have the results that we got in during one the first year of the measurement campaign in Punta Arenas, which as Patrick show is a very pristine location. We you, you have almost all the year westerly winds prevailing, and it is almost clean there. And then we have, as a contrast, we have Dushanbe located in the middle of the continent with very dry and polluted situation. So we really wanted to see how, what this new method says when we compare these two locations. So on both locations, we have a poly system measuring continuously with this new technique. And now this is the results that we get. These are preliminary results. So showing just one year at Punta Arenas where we got around 300 hours of liquid cloud observation. And then we have it to Chambé, the polluted case with about 260 hours of liquid cloud layers. And this is only considered eight months. And here we have the, firstly, the aerosol properties below the clouds. And these properties differ a bit of uh, what Patrick showed in which you consider monthly means. So here we have only the values in that we got in this 
in the cloud periods that we detect in these 300 fold hours. So here we have the extinction coefficient of particles, and then we have an estimation of the CCN concentration when we assume a given supersaturation value. So this is based in the polyphon uh, approach, which was uh, introduced by Mamuri and Asma 2016. And then we also have the optical depth, as also to show us the other parameter here, the contrast. So here is a clear difference. So we have more than one order of magnitude difference between the conditions in Punta Arenas when we assume marine aerosol to Dushanbe in which we separate the aerosol load into dust and non-dust by using the depolarization values. And this is firstly a good indicator that our LiDAR can really provide information about the CCN particles. Now, going to the cloud properties. So this aerosol properties, it's wrong here. So now we look at the cloud properties that we get with this new dual field of view polarization approach. So here we have, firstly, the cloud base. We see that at uh, Punta Arenas, clouds fall at much lower altitudes than in the case of Dushanbe, which is quite clear because in Dushanbe, usually we have a much uh, ex extense boundary layer. And now in the microphysical properties, we see that there are differences between these two regions by means of this new approach. So firstly, we see in the extinction coefficient, in the blue Punta Arenas, we have lower value, values than the values that we get for Dushanbe. A similar behavior can be seen in the effective radius in which we see that droplets can have much higher uh, sizes in Punta Arenas as in Dushanbe, which usually they stay at low values because of the perpetual uh, high concentration of aerosols there. In the liquid water content, at uh, 75 meters high, we don't see much differences. So we see that maybe a Punta Arenas, there is a little bit more. But in the droplet number concentration, we see a really con a clear contrast here of more than one order of magnitude. So we see in Punta Arenas values within 10, mostly within 10 and 200. And in Dushanbe, we see values between 100 and 800 more or less. And we also found here that our uh, estimation of CCN concentrations for Punta Arenas, the values are very similar than the values that we predict with this 12 field of view polarization technique for uh, number concentra concentration of droplets. And for Dushanbe, we found that our prediction of CCN at this supersaturation is more than two times the concentration that we get for droplet number, which is an indicator for us that this supersaturation, maximum supersaturation can be easily reached reach at the conditions in Punta Arenas, but in Dushanbe, it's most difficult to be reached. And just to give an idea now, in, in this case that I showed you before in Limassol, we have number concentrations about 200. So it is here more or less between both locations, but I would say it's closer to the situation at Dushanbe with much more particle. Of course, I just draw a line here because until now we have used these one cases. But of course, in the next time we want to implement this technique into our polynet processing chain in order to have all these calculations done automatically. So now we just have one case, but we expect this to grow in the, in the next months. So now going to another aspect, now, how about the relationship between the aerosol and cloud properties? So here I wanted to show you one uh, of the studies that we can do is by analyzing uh, the monthly means here and comparing how the cloud properties, in this case, the cloud drop number concentration evolve and comparing it with how the CCN number concentration also evolved during the year. By, by, uh, by means of this polyphone approach. So here we see that in the case of Punta Arenas for this one year measurements, we see that there is indeed a correlation and it is a very even a high value of this aerosol cloud interaction index, which is the relevant parameter to study how aerosols at the end affect the number concentration in the cloud. And in Dushanbe, 
we did the same analysis. We have here this box plot from the number concentration and of droplets, and in the bottom panel, the number concentration of CCN. And here again, we see that the CCN number concentrations, they are here, they are larger than the values of number concentration of droplets. But here we still, even if we have a low amount of point, we see that, that there is a relation, it's not so clear as in Punta Arenas. So we get here um, a lower value of this aerosol cloud interaction index. And just to give you an idea of what can we do with this, so for example, if we talk about the first uh, effect that aerosol have on cloud, which is the so-called Tommy effect, we can use this aerosol cloud interaction index to make an estimation of how much are affecting the, the aerosol at these two locations in the radiative budget. And we found here the following values, so between 0 0.2 and, and 0 0.7 more or less, minus for Punta Arenas, and they are even uh, larger in magnitude for Dushanbe. And this can be compared with, uh, with models which deal with this radiative impact. So this is this was so a brief overview of what can be done with this technique by analyzing the long-term measurements. And as an outlook, I would like to tell you that not only in pure liquid layers can be uh, applied this technique, but also in mixed state layers, because we found that in mixed state layers, there are many cases where you have a cloud like this, which is a measurement. Uh, perform in the polar thing in the Arctic during the mosaic campaign. And we see many cases in which we have this liquid layer on the top of these mixed phase clouds. And we found that usually the, the, the backscatter here in the, in the liquid layer is more than two orders of magnitude larger than the ice below. So we conclude that at the end, we can apply these methods because here we have a very well-defined cloud base and we can also apply this retrieval scheme. So we can, in this example, that's also Ronnie shows in his presentation, we can get the cloud open number concentration and the effective radius. And as I mentioned, this is applied in several systems. And now we have here in the case, another measurement from Limassol, now from the 2 of January, 2021. And here we see as well that we can apply the method and we can get some results in the case of a mixed phase cloud, as we can see here, when we have the, this is the signal and this is the depolarization. So here clearly we have very large depolarizations in the, in the ice virga, and then we have this well-defined liquid layers which, with lower values. So this is what I have until now to show you. So coming to a summary, so we have a new LiDAR approach to measure this, uh, the microphysical properties of liquid water clouds and the, all the technical aspects you can find it in these two, two publications. This new approach is uh, already implemented in six LiDAR instruments. And I would like to point out that the upgrade that is needed, it's not so big. It's, you just need one more channel if you are already measuring the polarization on one field of view. By contrasting the, the measurements that we got at two different locations, we found yeah, very contrasting results. And in the polluted region, we found number concentration of droplets, more or less one order of magnitude larger. And we found also found that the number concentration is more sensitive to aerosol perturbation in the pristine location, which is something that we can also expect. As in the polluted location, we all, always have so many particles that even if we change the amount of particles, it won't affect much the cloud as is in the case of the pristine location when they are really sensitive to these aerosol changes. And I would like to also mention that these uh, new capabilities can help us to also study mixed fake clouds and to better understand how these mixed fake cloud layers form, which will also have a very big impact in, in studies related to aerosol cloud interactions 
and the effect in the relative budget, but also in precipitation. So with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And yeah, maybe there are questions now. Thank you, Christopher. Uh, I think we will get the questions after the whole uh, session. Yeah. So uh, we can proceed with the next presentation, but it's uh, actually by myself. And uh, it's on precipitation monitoring in Cyprus using ground-based radar data. And let me share my screen. Okay, so um, my name is Eleni Luli. I'm a doctoral researcher at the Radoseni Center of Excellence and the Cyprus University of Technology. I come from a quite different background. I'm not a physicist. I, my background is in environmental engineering. And uh, my work is focused on uh, precipitation monitoring, actually drought monitoring in Cyprus as a case study for the Eastern Mediterranean um, region. And um, today I'm gonna present about precipitation monitoring intended for uh, drought monitoring. And uh, this work has started in the framework of Sirocco Restart project as a part of my PhD work, also under the guidance of uh, Dr. Johannes Bull from Tropos. Uh, this is the outline of my presentation. I will start with an introduction, some background information on drought. Um, information about the study area, and then I will explain uh, which data I am using, and uh, then also a summary of the initial state of the two data sets. That's uh, an important part of the and an important challenge of uh, my work. Then I will present the processing change that that chain that's basically the um, a methodology that I followed. And then I will uh, go on with the um, uh, results of the universal cube that I have produced. And with this, uh, the precipitation rate and precipitation classification uh, that uh, are implemented, these are very pre preliminary results on precipitation. And then I will uh, close with a discussion and future steps that uh, will be done. So some um, background information on drought. Drought is reported as a rainfall deficit with regard to its long-term mean, and it affects a large area for a certain time period. Uh, contrary to other natural disasters that we usually uh, study using remote sensing, drought has a variety of unique features. It is a multidimensional phenomenon. It starts imperceptibly, imperceptibly, advances slowly and cumula cumulatively, and these consequences show up gradually. So uh, it is crucial that we are also able to monitor drought and uh, also uh, understand when uh, it might start and um, take uh, the correct decisions uh, to mitigate its uh, consequences. So due to its peculiarity, uh, weather-based parameters and indices are usually not enough for the estimation of the temporal and spatial uh, drought features. We usually distinguish between four major drought types. Uh, these are the meteorological, the agricultural, uh, the hydrological, and the socioeconomic drought. Today, my presentation is focused on meteorological drought as uh, it's focused on precipitation. Now about the study area. Uh, the study area of my work is Cyprus as a case study for the Eastern Mediterranean region. Uh, Cyprus is located in the Southeast Mediterranean basin and its climate is described by mild dry to hot summers and cool to mild to wet winters. The mean annual precipitation of the island fluctuates between 400 and 500 millimeters and it has a decreased tendency in the coming years. Um, on the contrary, the mean annual temperature uh, varies from 14 to 18 uh, degrees Celsius following the topography, and this has an increased tendency in the coming years. 
Uh, in Cyprus, there are over 100 water dams and surface reservoirs that are operated on a daily basis, and they supply water mainly for agricultural activities that include both annual and permanent uh, crops. Uh, you can read some examples of the crops that uh, one can find in Cyprus. And droughts occur frequently in Cyprus, and they are the source to various problems uh, to the economy, the environment, and the agricultural production. So the target of uh, my study is to provide uh, the decision makers with a drought index that can assist them in um, taking the correct decision and also in terms of um, time to mitigate the impacts of drought uh, in the region of the East Mediterranean. Here we see the meteorological stations network of the um, uh, Department of Meteorology in Cyprus. From the first, um, when we just see it, we see that uh, there are a lot of um, stations. And also with the blue color, we can see the stations that measure rainfall. But uh, after some analysis I had and I did, um, I found out that there are a lot of gaps uh, in these stations. There are many days that uh, we don't have um, uh, enough uh, measurements. So uh, for some cases, it's really difficult to come to um, meaningful conclusions and reliable conclusions about uh, drought monitoring. So for my work, I am using um, uh, the two uh, plant position indicator stations, also by the Cyprus Department of Meteorology. They are um, operated since 2017, and they provide uh, continuous information for approximately 10 minutes. It says each station is composed of an expand Doppler dual polarization radar uh, that provides, uh, as I mentioned, continuous information on the estimation of rainfall and hydrometeor classification. They have a spatial resolution of 0.1 degrees and a radius of 150 kilometers. And they provide raw information uh, with a frequency of 10 minutes. The radars rotate through 360 degrees and they provide surveillance scans for eight different elevation angles. Here we see the position of the two radars uh, with respect to the digital elevation model of Cyprus. And with a very draft uh, drawing, you can see that um, they cover the whole extent of the island and also the fact that we have two stations on both sides of uh, Trodos Mountains. Uh, we can also um, make the um, attenuation correction uh, possible. And as I have raw information for, uh, from these two stations, I need to um, adjust and calibrate this information. So for this, I am using uh, NASA's Global Precipitation Measurement Mission as a reference data set. And specifically from, uh, the, from this mission, I'm using the DPR, um, the Dual Frequency Precipitation Radar that is uh, on board this constellation. Uh, the reason I'm not using uh, only this for uh, my studies is that um, this mission, this satellite passes, overpasses Cyprus approximately once per week or once per 10 days. So this is not enough for uh, continuous monitoring. So some information about the dual frequency uh, precipitation radar. It comprises a KU and a KA band uh, precipitation radar. So the KU and the KA precipitation radars are co-aligned on the GPM spacecraft, spacecraft bus. Uh, so that the five kilometers footprint uh, location on the Earth is the same. They collect uh, data and they provide three-dimensional observations of rain and also accurate estimation on, of rainfall rate. Uh, rain and snow determination is accomplished by using the differential attenuation between the two uh, band frequencies. 
And the DPR uh, is a radar that is capable of making accurate rainfall measurements um, as they provide uh, sensing over both land and ocean and also day and night. And the data that I'm using are also calibrated. Here we see some more details about um, the DPR. And specifically, uh, what I'm using is the precipitation rate and the vertical profile of reflectivity factor Z with attenuation correction that are found in the level 2A product of the GPM. So you can see that uh, this is already a process for missing data, scan time correction, geometric calculation, radiometric correction, and uh, from this is a level one processing. And the data I'm using is from level 2A. Uh, from GPM, there is also level three uh, products, but as uh, I'm interested in uh, mainly the reflectivity factor, uh, I'm using data from the level 2A. Here is a summary of the initial state of the two data sets I'm using. So GPM as a reference data set and specifically vertical profiles, vertical profiles of the reflectivity factor with attenuation correction and also the precipitation rate. And the X band is, uh, I called it level zero just for my uh, reference, is raw data. So here we can see uh, the processing chain. I will explain this uh, into more detail. So the main challenge of my work was to make the two datasets comparable. Um, so in order to, to achieve this, I, um, I developed a universal cube that has a specific, it's basically a bounding box of um, an area of interest that I selected over um, Cyprus, and it has a specific latitude and longitude. And the height is based on uh, the bin height of the um, GPM. So GPM provides vertical measurements. So uh, it provides on the Z axis measurements for every 125 meters. So I, I kept this uh, also for my universal cube. And this is the, um, the step of the Z axis of the universal cube. For the GPM, the processing was uh, more simple than uh, for the X band. Uh, what I did for the GPM was to interpolate uh, the level 2A um, data sets on this universal uh, cube. But for this, it was done only on the universal grid, so only on X and Y axis, as the, um, the Z axis was, was kept the same. Um, for the X band, the, method, the processing was a bit more complicated as the, the data were uh, raw data. So for this, I started with some pre-processing of the data. I uh, calculated them, I converted them in a linear scale. I calculated the range, the height and the distance, and then I, ge I georeferenced the, um, the data. Then, um, as I've mentioned, the GPM provides data for eight different elevations. So for each of these 10 minutes, I had eight different uh, scans. And uh, for each of these scans, I interpolated on the universal grid, firstly, only latitude and longitude, and I kept height as a separate grid. But then in order to interpolate somehow also the, the height, and the, um, the Z axis, I kind of sliced um, this, um, this data. So after this slicing method I followed, um, I had basically one universal cube for each of these eight scans. So the height is sliced and it's also based on the GPM uh, bin height. But again, um, the complexity here was that for each of these eight uh, scans, I have a separate uh, cube. So in order to, um, to have exactly the same uh, data sets, I assumed that during these 10 minutes of each uh, whole um, scan, so of all the eight scans, the measurements are, are constant. So I brought all of these eight scans together in one universal cube. 
and uh, after doing this processing, I uh, now I have the data sets and uh, they are both on the universal cube and I can uh, have one-to-one -one, uh, comparison. So here is um, uh, the universal cube for an example of um, um, one overpass uh, of the GPM that we also had the measurements from the um, expand radar. This is more for uh, visual matters, just to give you an idea how this uh, universal cube looks like. So as you can see, we have these uh, beams and with this, we can compare uh, the expand to the GPM um, for, for each cell, let's say. So here are some preliminary results on the precipitation rate. On the upper part, we can see the precipitation rate calculated using the um, standard reflectivity precipitation relation for each band after Caloiros. Uh, here it's important to mention that uh, the color scale on the upper part is different than on the um, lower part. This was done intentionally because uh, there are still some uh, issues with the um, uh, quantitative um, analysis of the precipitation, but I wanted to, to show this just to show that the spatial distribution uh, can be already detected. Uh, these are also for different heights above uh, the surface. So we can, from the first results, we can see that um, the GP, sorry, the expand radar can detect um, and the measurements agree with the precipitation rate derived from the GPM. Um, and this is another example with the precipitation rate equation uh, after the Marshall-Palmer relation. Uh, also for the same uh, date and time. And here the color scale is the same. And here we can see that the preliminary results uh, show an agreement um, for the quantity of the precipitation. Um, there are still some issues that need to be um, investigated about the spatial distribution. And also uh, about the attenuation correction, we can see on the GPM that there is a kind of hole in the middle of the island where we have uh, the mountains of Trodos. So this also needs to be considered and uh, it also needs to be corrected with the expand uh, radar measurements. This is also um, a preliminary precipitation, precipitation classification at different heights uh, using the um, reflectivity um, of the radar. And we can see the differentiation between heavy rain, light rain, and mist. So concluding to what I presented today, uh, the preliminary results uh, of this work show an agreement between the precipitation rate derived from expand measurements and the precipitation rate of uh, GPM DPR level 2A data sets. The standard reflectivity rainfall relation for expand shows higher precision in terms of spatial distribution. But the Marshall Palmer relation shows better results in terms of quantitative accuracy. So, um, with these preliminary results, there are also a lot of uh, future steps and work to be done to come with um, more reliable uh, outcomes. Uh, this includes the application of further rainfall retrieval algorithms on, on both uh, expand horizontal reflectivity and also on the GPM uh, reflectivity factor. The examples I've showed today were uh, compared to the GPM precipitation rate product and not the reflectivity factor, but I also want to investigate the, the comparison also to the reflectivity factor of the GPM. And um, also to compare the vertical profiles of the both data sets and investigate further calibration methods also using the signal noise ratio. Um, in the framework of uh, Sirocco project, we also want to compare um, these precipitation and reflectivity measurements with uh, the side care campaign measurements. 
And uh, also further work includes the correction of attenuation, which is something that I showed in the previous slide, uh, why it needs to be done, and uh, the calculation of drought level per each cell of this universal uh, cube. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you for your attention. And I think we can... Uh, again, proceed to the next presentation, which is the last um, presentation for today, and then we can go to uh, questions. Um, this presentation uh, is done, will be done by Dr. Johannes Bull on behalf of uh, Dr. Martin Radens, who couldn't make it uh, today. Uh, the topic is uh, about uh, hemispheric con contrast in ice formation in strata for mixed phase clouds, disentangling the role of aerosol and dynamics with ground based remote sensing. Uh, Dr. Martin Radens is also a member of uh, Tropos team and he works on hemispheric contrast in the effect of aerosol uh, ice formation in strategy for mixed waste clouds and in the implementation of field campaigns. Um, Johannes, you can share your screen. Yes. Thank you. Um, one second. <clears throat> so, hello again. I'm not Martin Rattens, I'm Johannes Bühl, and, um, but Martin is um, actually could actually not attend this workshop. And um, I will present some of his work, um, uh, which is related to Cyprus. Uh, I will actually present material from his, um, uh, from his, from, from his PhD thesis. So the material is from him. All uh, errors that I produce are, of course, on me. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that as a caveat. So, um, what is the question? So, that's that's basically what's the scope of Martin's PhD thesis, and uh, that started more or less um, when we had the Psycare campaign, and so we had a lot of questions in our mind. Um, so we knew from, um, from observations that the ice nucleating particles are very rare in the Southern Oceans. You can see this on this map of um, ice nucleating particles that you have very low numbers in the Southern Ocean compared to very high numbers in the um, vicinity of um, Northern hemispheric landmasses. So the question, um, arises, of course, um, together with the, with the measurements we did before, um, what is going on there? So we had these measurements of, uh, for example, here, the fraction of ice containing clouds um, made before. So what we found is that um, the clouds at Punta Arenas are less likely to produce ice then it liked the question, and the, and the question the, that we dealt with uh, during the last um, 10 years was, why is this? Is, I mean, again, we, we knew about this, this relationship, is we knew about this, this tendency that there is less aerosol. Um, so, the, so the question uh, was, what role does aerosol play in this um, uh, context? And of course, there was the, the need for a new measurement campaign. So we, we placed our LIDARs and uh, combined stations at Limassol, where, where the uh, aerosol load is very high, and at Punta Arenas, where the aerosol load is very low. And um, yeah, additional questions uh, for, that came up in the last years was that, for example, models show, la show large errors in the radiation budget of the southern uh, oceans and the mid-latitudes. And another problem is that if you observe uh, liquid water, you have to make sure that it's not just an updraft that made this liquid water, but that is 
that the cloud is actually stable, that you can do this analysis. So this, this was the context, scientific context. And of course, you can do the, you can try and solve this um, on the basis of modeling. Um, this is an air mass origin study uh, where Martin just uh, put together the profiles of different um, um, residence times of aerosol that was were observed at um, Leipzig, at Limassol and Punta Arenas. And you can see that um, the residence time for aerosol that is observed over Limassol is much more likely to originate from the Sahara. So the, the residence time is larger. So the aerosol is uh, much more likely to be uh, to, to origin from the Sahara than at Leipzig. Of course, at Punta Arenas, we have other relevant desert sources. And the one is South Africa. Um, and the most um, significant uh, source for desert dust is, of course, Australia. Uh, but you can see this, so that the, the probability to get um, desert dust from Australia at Punta Arenas is still very low compared to uh, the northern land masses. So, um, Patrick showed these plots before. So this is um, a photo of the Da Capo Peso campaign at Punta Arenas. Uh, we went there with our full suite of measurement instruments with additional 94 gigahertz um, cloud radar from Leipziger Institute for Meteorology. And there were additional sensors, radiation sensors and some uh, CCN sensors also placed. Uh, Patrick mentioned this before. And I will now um, talk about the results of this measurement campaign, also in compare, always in comparison between Punta, uh, for, always as a comparison between Punta Arenas and Limassol. So one major instrument of this whole, instrument of this whole suite of instruments is of course the poly XT LiDAR, which gives you the information about the aerosol. And uh, this is one of the, the first, um, I would say, major result. Uh, here on this axis, you can see aerosol extinction. Um, and, and this axis uh, gives you the ambient temperature at which this aerosol extinction was observed. And already this gives you an idea um, <coughs> of what's going on. Um, there is this, I would say, artifact <laughs> in the um, analysis that at around zero degree, the aerosol load is actually quite uh, similar. But that's, um, that's not so, from, from my point of view, it's, um, it's not so important uh, because uh, the more basic message between, uh, the, the, more, the more, more basic message is that the aerosol load is actually always at least a factor of five difference. And this is this kind of confirms that um, we really have a, a completely different situation um, at Limassol and at Punta Arenas. So and with that, we can work. So there is um, a closer look into the optical data. Maybe the LiDAR people uh, of you will be more familiar with this linear plot, for example, here. This is particle backscatter coefficient as it is usually plotted um, for polynet with height. Uh, and, and here you can already see um, that there is a there's a large difference uh, in the aerosol distribution with height. Uh, here, for example, the blue line is the mean curve for Punta Arenas and the orange curve is the mean curve for Limassol. But you have to consider that also the extreme values at uh, Limassol the 90 per, um, the the 90 uh, percent percentile is really a, a very very different to what you can observe at Punta Arenas. That's the same in a in a log plot uh, representation, and here the plot that you show, show that you saw before with the particle extinction coefficient and the particle linear depolarization ratio gives you a very very clear message here at um, Lima Sol. You have a lot of dust in the air. At um, Punta Arenas, dust is more or less absent because the polarization that is observed is very low. So that's the first, um, basically, look 
um, that we can uh, have into the aerosol properties um, with the LiDAR. And now let's look at, so we have a good impression about the aerosol background. Now let's look at the other measurements instruments like the Doppler LiDAR and the cloud radar, which gives, gives you additional information about the velocity, the motion, and um, <clears throat> the size of the uh, precipitating particles, for example. So, but I won't, don't want to get into detail about every um, measurement instrument that was involved here, but give you a, a clear overview with a case study. Um, this is actually the signal of the cloud radar, gives you radar reflectivity. Um, you can see basically only the eyes of the cloud. The LiDAR in turn gives you the liquid layers in addition. So it gives you here information that there is a liquid layer. There are two other liquid layers of which one is not observed by the cloud radar and another one is at least partially observed by the cloud um, radar. Yeah, and from this information and some other auxiliary information, you can compute the cloud net target categorization. So Martin did this for the whole uh, Bunturian data set. This is not trivial. This was not tri trivial, <laughs> actually. This was a major work. And you can see the result for this uh, case study here. So you have ice and liquid at the top of the uh, cloud mixed. And where it's yellow, you can see that the, you can see the pure ice is falling from this cloud. And on the right side, there are two clouds that are more or less completely liquid. So, and yeah, uh, now it's the question, what's, what's the, the statistics? How often can we observe such a case and how often can we observe such cases which do not um, show um, eyes? And again, that was our um, basically study before, that was our view before with the LiDAR only analysis in 2011. Uh, the curve, black curve at Punta Arenas and the red curve at Leipzig. And with our new analysis, that looks a little bit uh, different on the first glance. So um, first look at the solid lines at Punta Arenas, the combined LiDAR and radar data set um, produces this blue solid line. And at Lima Sol and at Leipzig, you can see the solid green and the orange line, which are more or less the same. <clears throat> but of course, it's LiDAR and radar, and the radar is more sensitive to, um, to ice particles th than the LiDAR only. So we applied um, a threshold um, at which the uh, radar signal and the LiDAR signal are more or less equivalent for detecting uh, liquid clouds. And if you apply this threshold, you can basically compute from the combined data set, what only a LiDAR would have seen. And this is the dashed lines and they correspond then, correspond then very well with the um, original data sets um, from um, the LiDAR studies in 2011. Um, so we are very sure that we did, not, did, did measure a representative data set in both cases and the data is comparable. But what's what's going on here i mean still we have huge differences and that was actually one uh, thing that martin um, radens um, explored in his thesis the whole reasons why these um, um, curves were so different and, and and he found out that there was one major factor that had to be taken into account and that was actually the andes the um, the gravity waves that were, or the mountain lee waves that were basically emitted by the Andes. And you can see those here in this case. Um, again, the same case study, but this time with the velocity, um, vertical velocity of the cloud radar, measured by the cloud radar and uh, measured by the Doppler LiDAR. So you can see that you have extreme updraft and downward motions induced into, into these clouds. And they, of course, they will stabilize these clouds. So, so they will also produce clouds that are very young, that have a lot of liquid water in them. And the next challenge is, of course, now, what, what do we do with this information? And um, Martin um, 
made a invented a method to filter out basically these um, these liquid only clouds that are just created uh, from these gravity waves, and so he could um, correct for this effect. And the end result looks like this. So if you take into account the gravity uh, waves of the um, of the mountains, and if you only look at free tropospheric clouds, which are not influenced by the boundary layer, you get to this temperature distribution. And basically that is the real result. That is the real difference um, between the sites Limassol, Leipzig and Punta Arenas without um, the orographic and the, the basically meteoro meteorological uh, parameters that disturb your statistics. And this difference basically marked in red, this, there is only basically one last um, property left, and this is the aerosol load in the atmosphere. At least we cannot think of something else at the moment. <laughs> but this is um, what we contribute to the aerosol effect. And uh, Patrick also showed this graph before. So we are talking about at least this area of a factor of, uh, let's say, 10, um, where we have a difference. But this is the maximum assumption um, which applies um, a very conservative assumption. Probably the factor of um, IN um, difference is higher because we have probably a very large proportion of marine particles with less uh, proportions of continental particles. So that explains um, why clouds at Punta Arenas form uh, ice with uh, less form from less frequently ice than at Limassol and uh, classifies or quantifies this um, aerosol impact on ice formation in these clouds. Yeah, that's that's from my side. Those are results, as I said, those are not my results. But I wanted to show them to you because uh, I wanted to also to make you aware of this large data set. And um, if you have questions about this, you can, of course, always get back to us and we can discuss about it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Johannes. And also thanks to uh, Martin for his work. And uh... We can get some questions now. We uh, finished with the presentations for today. So if there are any questions we can um, answer now, please either, uh, turn on your microphones or uh, type in the chat. This is the awkward moment of me waiting for questions. <laughs> so I guess there are no questions. So we can uh, close today's uh, workshop. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, you can stay tuned for uh, the results of Sirocco Restart uh, workshop in our web website and the social media platforms and enjoy your weekend thank you thank you bye 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 thank you